Hello again, Professor Jared Rathel here, and this is lecture 4.3 in ABS 470. It's entitled Biogeography and Global Provincialism in Mammalian Distributions. So when we think about mammalian distributions around planet Earth, why is it that we see myrmacophagus, meaning ant and termite eating mammals, on nearly every continent on the planet. Yet, they're all different. How do scientists explain the abundance of marsupials in Australia and South America, but their absence or scarcity on northern continents? Why are there camels in Asia, North Africa, and South America? What factors led to the present distribution of primates from Japan to Africa to South America? So these are biogeographical questions. This lecture is going to align with chapter five, which is entitled Biogeography. Please note, and this is also uh, in Canvas, but you may skip the sections in your textbook entitled Biogeographic Inference, as well as the section simply called Examples. Biogeography is the study of the distribution of organisms, both living and extinct, around our planet. The most basic unit of biogeography is the species range. That is to say, the complete area over the planet over which individuals of a particular species occur. So as an example, this is Puma Conchalor. Common names include the mountain lion, the cougar, the panther, the catamount, all the same species. Uh, so Puma Conchalor is distributed from British Columbia all the way down through the southern tip of Argentina. As you likely recognize, uh, species ranges are dynamic. They're not fixed in time. They're, they're changing, especially as humans rapidly transform both the surface of the planet as well as its atmosphere, our climate. An endemic species is one that's restricted in its range only to a circumscribed area. It's only found there. So, for example, we can say that lemurs are endemic to Madagascar. They're only found in Madagascar. Lemurs are not found across the channel in Mozambique. Endemism is really important in conservation biology because it helps us identify biological hotspots, regions around the world that have really unique flora and fauna that are worth conserving, like Madagascar. A second pattern of interest is known as disjunct distribution. So that simply means that there's a gap in the range of related species or some taxonomic clade. So as you already know, uh, marsupials are abundant on the continent of Australia and the island of Tasmania, as well as in South America. And then we have the Virginia opossum here in North America. You may also recall that the oldest Metatherian fossil yet recovered is Sinodelphes, which dates at 125 million years ago and was recovered in Asia of all places. Further, the oldest confirmed marsupial fossil recovered dates at 65 million years ago, and that's in North America. So it suggests that the ancestors of modern marsupials dispersed from Asia to North America and then down into South America. And we know that South America represents the cradle of marsupial evolution. 
Marsupials then make their way across a once green Antarctica, and it may have been just one colonizing species that makes it to Australia some 50 million years ago. And the winner of that sweepstakes, their descendants are then going to go on and fill almost every conceivable mammalian ecological niche in Australia. Ecological biogeography is going to focus on the current distributions of species but it's going to seek to explain those distributions in terms of community level interactions between the species and their environment. So one common line of inquiry uh, within ecological biogeography is thinking about species richness. So that refers to how many species are in the system, in the region. And it leads to questions like, why is it that we see so many mammalian species distributed between about 23 degrees north of the equator down to 23 degrees south in this tropics in the tropical band here. So think about the Amazon rainforest or East Africa. So you can see species richness uh, for mammals is quite high uh, in these regions. Uh, whereas places like Antarctica, they have very few mammals. Okay, further, um, when we think about ecological biogeography, we can think about islands and why certain islands have relatively high species richness compared to other islands. So, and we're going to come back to island biogeography, but it has to do with the size of the island as well as its distance from the mainland. So answers to ecological biogeographical questions are going to involve evolutionary adaptations. So ecological biogeography is going to frequently entail studying patterns of morphological, physiological, and or life history variation among mammals in different places. If we tabulate the number of species and major clades of virtually any group of animals or plants for that matter, they occur in different continental regions of the earth. And in doing so, two patterns are going to emerge. First, different regions harbor distinct taxonomic assemblages. So there's, there's endemism on a worldwide scale. So think kangaroos, they're endemic to Australia. Gibbons in Southeast Asia, sloths in South and Central America. Second pattern, there are dramatic differences in species richness amongst the continental regions. Some regions represent centers of diversity while others simply do not. So these observations together with knowledge about phylogenetic or evolutionary relationships demonstrate this provincialism, these provinces of life on planet Earth. And it's a pattern that's evident in the tetrapod fossil record since the early Mesozoic some 250 million years ago. It was way back in 1876 that the famous naturalist who worked out both the mechanics and the profound implications of natural selection independent of Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace. He's the first to divide the world up into faunal regions, for which he identifies six regions, each with a distinct assemblage of species. 
those are the pale arctic the knee arctic the neotropical what he deems as the ethiopian oriental and australian so wallace noted that although the distance between the islands of Bali and Lombok in Indonesia is only a little over 20 miles. In fact, on a clear day, you can see from Bali to Lombok, from one island to the next, the faunal assemblages on those two islands are worlds apart. So Bali and everything north of what has now been deemed Wallace's line. Everything up here is Asian, um, part of the Oriental species assemblage. So think uh, crab-eating macaques. Meanwhile, everything south of Wallace's line is Australian. So think about tree kangaroos on Papua New Guinea. All right, you know the drill. Please put me on pause and check out Wallace, Darwin's forgotten frenemy, uh, which is embedded in Canvas. Thanks. Next, I'm going to take you on a really quick tour of Wallace's six faunal regions. So for each of the regions, I'll explain where it's at on the planet, the major biomes that comprise each region, and then I'll highlight any endemic families in the region. That is to say, families of mammals that are found in that region and no place else. So we'll begin with the Pale Arctic. This is the largest of the faunal regions, and it consists of the Old World. That is to say, Europe, Russia, and northern China. It's separated from the Ethiopian region uh, by the deserts of the Middle East. It's separated from the Oriental region by the Himalayan mountains, which is a pretty formidable barrier. And then it's separated from the Nearctic region uh, by the Bering Strait. So there's an eastward band of taiga, a uh, coniferous forest that's going to run about 60 degrees north latitude. Let's see, the southwestern pale arctic includes the Mongolian steppes while there's temperate deciduous forest and chaparral forests in Europe. And then the Pale Arctic is home to just one endemic subfamily, the blind mole rats, shown top left. The Pale Arctic mammals represent a mixture of Nearctic, Ethiopian, as well as Oriental elements. So think cervids, bovids, ursids, and felids but there are certainly unique lineages uh, within these families. So uh, the Bactrian camel shown here, or the Siberian tiger, uh, bottom, middle, um, or the adorable giant panda. The knee Arctic extends from beyond the Arctic Circle here in northern Canada all the way down to the um, central Mexican plateau, and it's going to include the island of Greenland. The knee Arctic is separated from the Pale Arctic, as mentioned on the previous slide, by uh, the Bering Strait. And the Nearctic is separated from the Neotropics uh, by this Central American transition zone, uh, this tropical uh, rainforest. Like the Pale Arctic, the Nearctic consists of tundra up north and taiga, coniferous forest. Uh, there's also deciduous forests uh, on our eastern uh, seaboard as well as grasslands and then uh, chaparral forests and deserts where we live in the southwest. 
Many of the families that we find in the knee Arctic uh, also exist in the pale Arctic because these two regions have often been connected uh, by the Bering Land Bridge, uh, which multiple times uh, in the past have connected uh, Siberia to Alaska. There are relatively few mammalian families that are endemic to the knee Arctic, uh, but there are two, and those are the families uh, of the pronghorn antelope as well as the mountain beaver. The neotropics or the new tropics extends from central Mexico all the way down to the tip of South America. The region is mostly isolated, it's surrounded by oceans, uh, but its northern boundary roughly coincides with a transition uh, from xeric or dry subtropical desert to moister tropical forests. Okay, so that's a tough boundary uh, to cross. Tropical wet forests of the Amazon uh, dominate the neotropics with grasslands and deserts uh, to the south of the Amazon and then alpine habitats that are associated with those high impressive Andes mountains along the western margin of South America. The neotropics are a true center of diversity. They have large numbers of mammal families and many of them are endemic. So think uh, guinea pigs, uh, the cavids, this is a wild guinea pig here. Uh, sloths, the two and three toed sloths that we've covered. Uh, New world monkeys, we're gonna cover primates next. Um, we spent quite a bit of time thinking about the opossums, the many different opossums that are found in South America. And then lastly, the selenodons are endemic to the region and they're found in the Caribbean. Moving over to the continent of Africa, uh, Wallace deemed this faunal region the Ethiopian region, and it's going to refer to sub-Saharan Africa, that is to say the portion of the African continent which is south of the expansive Saharan desert, uh, including the island of Madagascar. So the Saharan desert and the deserts of the Middle East, that's going to form the transition zone, the boundary between the Ethiopian faunal region and that of the Pale Arctic. Uh, biomes in Africa, uh, there is a massive swath of tropical rainforest here uh, in the Congo. Uh, southwestern Africa is characterized by desert, so the Kalahari Desert, excuse me. Uh, we've got savanna in um, eastern Africa. And then over in uh, Madagascar, there's rainforest on the east side and savanna on the west. And uh, those habitats are going to run parallel along that island. So there is a great diversity of mammals uh, in Africa and it's been attributed in part to restriction of plio-pleistocene extinction. So they're just we didn't see the extinctions uh, in the Pliocene and Pleistocene in Africa that we saw in other regions like North America. Further, uh, there's been a relatively recent diversification of moderately large bodied animals uh, in Africa. So endemism in Africa and the Ethiopian region is really high uh, on the island of Madagascar, which you probably guessed. Uh, endemic species to Madagascar include the uh, lemurs, uh, which we'll talk about next when we talk about primates, as well as these really cool bats. Uh, <clears throat> they are called uh, sucker-footed bats, and if you look closely uh, at their hands, their little suckers cups to adhere uh, to the surfaces of leaves. So really cool endemic bats in Madagascar as well as uh, the Tenrex are endemic. Uh, to this region. On the mainland, uh, Ethiopian endemics include uh, the golden moles, 
the elephant shrews. You remember we went over those, uh, as well as the aardvark. And then there's an incredible uh, radiation of terrestrial set artiodactyls, uh, hoofed animals uh, like uh, the wildebeest, which we'll cover later in the semester. The Oriental region is comprised of the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, and the Malay archipelago north and west of Wallace's line. So the Oriental region, uh, the primary biome is tropical rainforest, and it is a stunningly beautiful forest as somebody uh, who spent uh, quite a bit of time in Thailand. The mammal diversity in the Orient is quite high. There are five endemic families, including the Dermoptera, the Kalugos, and the Scandentia, the tree shrews, both of which we've just covered, as well as the aptly named hog-nosed bats, the gibbons, and the tarsiers, uh, both primates that we'll cover next. And then the last point that I'd like to make is the Oriental region is really a crossroads. And so it's going to consist of Ethiopian families, um, so the Asiatic lion, lions evolved in Africa. Uh, the Asiatic lion was once incredibly widespread. Uh, sadly, there's only a few hundred uh, Asiatic uh, uh, lions left. They're marooned uh, in the Gear Forest of India. And then uh, the Ursids, uh, this is a pale Arctic family, the bear family. Um, an oriental species is the sun bear, uh, which was also once widely distributed, uh, but now the sun bear's main stronghold is in Cambodia. The Australian faunal region obviously includes the continent of Australia, as well as New Guinea and Tasmania. So it's bounded by Wallace's line here in the Northwest, which we've discussed, and then it's surrounded by oceans, which means it's highly isolated. There uh, is a variety of biomes in Australia. It's mostly desert, uh, but we have tropical rainforest in northeastern Australia in places like Cairns and Townsend, as well as in New Guinea. There are temperate deciduous forests in the southeast. There's chaparral forests in the south. There's temperate rainforests in eastern Tasmania. So as you likely recognize, because Australia is so isolated, uh, it's going to share very few of its mammalian families with other areas. So endemism is quite high. Um, endemics include the monotremes like the spiny echidnas and the duck-billed platypus as well as many marsupial orders, including uh, the Dazzy Euromorphia, like this tiger quoll, uh, the Noto Rictomorphia, like the marsupial mole here, the uh, Bilby, or the rabbit-eared bandicoot, uh, the Diprotodontia, which are the kangaroos and the wallabies. So the only recent route of exchange for Australian mammals is by crossing Wallace's line. And there's two Eutherian groups that have done just that, the bats and the murid rodents, who we will talk about. So they've invaded. Uh, a good example is this species here. This is the Gould's mouse, named after Stephen J. Gould. Um, it was thought to be extinct for for 150 years, but was recently found thriving on numerous small islands off the western coast of Australia. So that's your feel-good story for the lecture.
And our final faunal region is actually not one that was identified by Wallace, but it's pretty important uh, with respect to mammalian distributions, and that is the oceanic faunal region. It's comprised of mammals that live on isolated, remote islands far from continental land masses. Uh, so think about the Hawaiian hoary bat or these really beautiful rats. This is the slender uh, slender tailed cloud rat from the island of Luzon in the Philippines. So it's going to include uh, insular species as well as our aquatic species, those living uh, close to coasts like the manatees and the dugongs, uh, as well as pelagic species, fully marine species that live out in the open ocean. So oceanic islands, particularly those that are volcanic in their origin, uh, they tend to have very few mammal species. Only those mammals that could reach there uh, by wind, wave, or wing. Um, so in Hawaii, for example, there's only two endemic mammals, the Hawaiian hoary bat as well as the monk seal. Those islands uh, that do have mammals, they're mostly bats and small rodents or mammals that have um, been uh, dispersed to the region by us, by humans. It's, their dispersal's been facilitated by humans. Uh, so think about our uh, menagerie. So pigs, goats, uh, the Norway ship rat that's rode everywhere with us around the planet. Among the marine groups, uh, we know the Serenians, the manatees, and the dugongs. Uh, they occur along tropical coasts. Uh, the pinnipeds, uh, like these sea lions, they're going to breed on pack ice uh, in the uh, Arctic and uh, Antarctic regions, as well as nearshore rocks or coastal areas. And then uh, we have the cetaceans, uh, like this beautiful breaching humpback whale and uh, these uh, spinner dolphins, which are amazing to see. Uh, these are pelagic species, meaning they're denizens of the open ocean. The suggestion that the continents of planet Earth drift over vast periods of time was actually first proposed way back in 1915 by Wagner. But it wasn't accepted until the 1960s because up until that time, there was no geological mechanism known that could account for such movement. Plate tectonics is going to provide that mechanism. So the Earth's crust including the continents and the ocean floor, is made up of rocky plates that are actually floating on denser, partially melted, molten mantle rock. There are some 10 of these major plates, and then there are numerous smaller plates. They're separated from one another uh, by ridges, trenches, and faults. So as heat from Earth's core radiates outward, it creates convection currents right uh, in this viscous mantle rock which is going to move these land masses so here's a really nice visualization created by the california academy of sciences that demonstrates the breakup of the supercontinent of pangaea and into uh, Gondwana land, and then the movement of our continents to their current positions. So this abiotic process happened over the past 200 million years, 
really important uh, with respect to mammalian evolution because it's going to create isolation and then adaptive radiations and it's going to really be the driver for this provincialism, these centers of diversity that we've been discussing that really shape mammalian distributions today. So please take the two minutes uh, and check out this visualization. The climate or the long-term weather patterns of a particular area on planet Earth is the result of interactions between sunlight, the atmosphere, the land masses themselves, as well as ocean currents. So a portion of the sun's infrared radiation that reaches the Earth is reflected back off the surface and then it's trapped by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases like methane. This blanket of gases in the atmosphere is what creates the greenhouse effect and it makes our planet livable, inhabitable. But, as I'm sure you're aware, the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere is rapidly rising. So we're currently at 420 parts per million. That's the most CO2 in our atmosphere in the past 400,000 years as measured by Antarctic ice cores. So 400,000 years, that's longer than we've even been homo sapiens. Sapiens. Although the Earth is warming at an unprecedented rate today, at several times in Earth's history, levels of greenhouse gases fell and continents occupied positions that blocked the flow of warm equatorial ocean water to the poles. And we got ice ages. So, for example, in the Carboniferous, much of southern Gondwana was covered by glaciers, which had dramatic impacts on the pelicosaurs. And I hope you remember them way back from Module 1. More recently, from the mid-Miocene on, which is about 15 million years ago, the world became cooler and drier until roughly two million years ago when it was plunged into the Pleistocene Ice Age. So glaciation during this period was most dramatic in the Nearctic uh, in North America, which you can see here, where there were these giant ice sheets, these incredible glaciers uh, that covered most of modern Canada and the northern United States. And it shifted the tundra and the taiga, the coniferous forests, southward between about 1.7 million years ago up until as recently as 10,000 years ago continental glaciers advanced and then retreated at least four times giving rise to a cycle of glacial and then interglacial periods that culminated in the recent distributions of many modern mammals that are still responding to the last glacial retreat. And now, of course, the big question is, are they going to be able to respond to anthropogenic climate change? The term dispersal has two closely related meanings in ecology. The first is when individuals or small groups of individuals leave their natal area, the place where they're born and raised, to go and breed elsewhere. So think about young male wolves that disperse from their uh, natal pack to form their own new pack. So so these types of dispersals, they're going to occur within the lifetime of an individual organism. And we refer to this as ecological dispersal. Dispersal in the sense that we're interested in uh, today, in the biogeographic sense, refers to a species expanding its range. Uh, so species dispersal. 
Species dispersal can be passive dispersal. Uh, so think rodents rafting to an island, and then they hit the sweepstakes and they land uh, on this new island with no competition. Or species dispersal can be active. So that's when individuals of a species actively disperse via a corridor route. A corridor route is one that provides minimal resistance to the passage of animals between two areas. Uh, whereas a filter route is going to do just that. It's going to filter out some animals. It's only going to allow some animals to pass through uh, the filter route. Uh, so for example, flying bats are really good at getting through filters, the filter of Wallace's line, as well as animals that have really large home ranges. Uh, so think about Puma concolor uh, from uh, British Columbia all the way down to South America. Um, so a great example of a filter route is the Panamanian land bridge that forms between North and South America about 3.5 million years ago and facilitated the Great American Biotic Interchange. So this Ted Ed is going to do a very nice job of breaking that down for you. So check it out. In the Pliocene, about three and a half million years ago, this land connection between North and South America was reestablished by the emergence of the Isthmus of Panama right here, which is going to initiate extensive dispersal of mammals between the two continents. So it's important to note Panama was initially savanna, very similar uh, to savanna habitats in the north and the south. So initially it's a corridor for southward dispersing mammals such as horses and deer as well as savanna dwelling mammals from South America like the glyptodonts and the ground sloths. However, Panama is going to develop into a tropical rainforest during the Pleistocene, and then it's going to be less of a corridor and more of a filter, which is only going to allow some animals through. Uh, so from the north, uh, rabbits and squirrels, rodents, the canids, the bears, the raccoons, they were able to cross uh, this filter and make their way into South America, uh, whereas uh, shrews and beavers and pronghorns did not make it. Okay, thinking uh, uh, the other way, um, porcupines and opossums were able to invade uh, North America along with the nine-banded armadillo. However, most armadillos and anteaters and the tropical sloths uh, were not able to make it through that filter. So the difference between a corridor and a filter route really uh, nicely exhibited uh, by the Great American Biotic Interchange, which was initially a corridor and then became more of a filter. Just as extinction is going to reduce the species richness of a clade, evolutionary diversification is going to increase species richness. So diversification in this sense is nothing more than speciation. But the most noteworthy cases of speciation, those in which it happens very rapidly and we see this incredible explosion of new descendant species in a geographically restricted area, we're going to refer to these as adaptive radiations. 
So some spectacular examples of adaptive radiations when um, you know one species uh, makes it to a new area and we see this incredible flowering of new species uh, include the lemurs uh, on the island of Madagascar of which there are over a hundred species. There's my favorite, the I.I. I. Uh, the New World Monkeys, another uh, wondrous adaptive radiation, which we'll cover in our next lecture. And then, of course, the Australian marsupials, which we've talked about at length, of which there are over 240 species. In these cases, the ancestors uh, of these clades, they disperse into this new region and they encounter little competition in this new range, or they get there and they outcompete the residents uh, that are in that niche. A striking regularity in mammalian phylogeny is the number of times that ecologically similar species have arisen in different areas and from different ancestors because of convergent evolution. So this is a topic that I've discussed multiple times this semester thus far. Uh, for example, myrmecophagy, which I discussed on the first slide, uh, mammals that specialize on eating ants and termites with its specialized cranial morphology and those elongated sticky tongues. That's evolved in six different mammalian orders, including the number bats pictured here which are uh, the marsupial order dazzy uromorphia uh, the anteaters there's a giant anteater here which is in the order pelosa the pangolins which are the folidota the ard wolves in the order carnivora the ard varks uh, the tubule edentata and the echidnas which are monotremes so your semester capstone project, uh, which I will uh, describe in detail later, um, is going to allow you to explore convergent evolution in much greater depth. It's a fascinating topic. Since the 19th century, a number of regularities have been noted in the ways that mammals vary with geography. Many of these patterns have been codified as eco-geographic rules. Um, but as your textbook notes, none of the patterns that I'm about to describe are invariant. There's a lot of exceptions. And some of these rules uh, really have questionable generality. And all of these rules are going to be the result of complex historical and environmental factors. Thus, uh, we call them rules, but they're only rules really in the loosest sense. So we'll start with the island rule, and it's formulated on the observation that small mammals on islands tend to evolve larger body sizes than their close relatives, their ancestors on the mainland. We see this insular or island gigantism on the island of Flores uh, in Indonesia with its giant rat. So here's the Flores giant rat, um, considerably larger than rats that are uh, found on the southeastern Asian mainland. Conversely, the island rule states that large mammals are gonna show the opposite trend. So uh, island species usually evolve smaller body sizes than their mainland counterparts. So the eco-evolutionary underpinning goes like this. For large mammals like elephants, 
resource limitations on small islands, small land masses, should be the most intense selection pressure. And therefore, it's going to favor reduced body size. There just isn't as much forage for elephants on islands. So there's going to be selection for smaller and smaller elephants. However, smaller mammals, uh, when they arrive on islands, they're going to have reduced interspecific competition, i.e. ecological release, which is going to favor the evolution of larger body sizes uh, for these small mammals, uh, which are less likely to experience resource limitations uh, because of smaller areas uh, that islands represent. So if we go back to the island of Flores, we see insular dwarfism in pygmy elephants, uh, which are now extinct. And then what I find most fascinating is uh, insular dwarfism in Homo florensis, the hobbit. <laughs> which likely evolved uh, from much larger bodied Homo erectus. And uh, this little uh, hominid, it may have died out as recently as 50,000 years ago. So it may have overlapped uh, with uh, the first peoples uh, in Indonesia. This is such an amazing discovery uh, that I want you to take a few minutes and just check this out. It is just so cool. One of the earliest eco-geographic rules was that of Bergman way back in 1847. And he observed that body sizes of both mammals and birds tend to increase with increasing latitude. Mammals are going to get larger as we move farther north and south away from the equator. The argument underlying this latitudinal size gradient is based on the superior heat conserving capacity of larger bodied endotherms. So a typical large mammal has a much lower surface area to volume ratio. They have uh, more volume relative to their surface than a small mammal. Hence, smaller surface area across which to lose body heat at cold temperatures. So this subspecies of red fox here, this is the Arabian fox, it has a much lower body mass and a lot more surface area relative to its volume, uh, which is going to allow it to dissipate heat. Um, compared to um, this Arctic fox, uh, which has <laughs> is considerably chunkier and has a larger body mass and is better able to conserve heat, uh, less surface, more mass in those Arctic uh, temperatures. So uh, Blackburn and Hawkins uh, from 2004, this is figure 5.18 in your textbook, uh, they found uh, that average annual temperature is the strongest predictor among six factors they evaluated um, in predicting average log body mass uh, in North American mammals. Okay, um, so here are these really cold regions and you can see the mammals tend to be much larger bodied and as average temperature warms, uh, mammalian body sizes get smaller. So this is a negative uh, polynomial model. 
extending Bergman's reasoning about thermoregulatory adaptations in endotherms, in 1877, Allen uh, proposes this rule uh, that mammals, as well as birds again, living in cold climates have shorter appendages than do their close relatives living in warmer environments. So long limbs and tails and certainly ears, uh, they're going to increase the surface area for heat dissipation in mammals, which is adaptive as a cooling mechanism in hot, dry environments like the Sonoran Desert. Uh, it certainly appears to be the case in uh, jackrabbits in comparison uh, to Arctic hares. In 1883, uh, Gloger noticed an apparent correlation between the plumage color of closely related birds and the humidity levels of their habitats with birds with darker feathers more frequently found in human environments and birds with lighter feathers more likely to exist in dry areas. So in mammals, the rule would apply to their pelage, their fur color. So for example, white, uh, light-colored polar bears inhabiting the very dry Arctic in contrast with the dark brown grizzly bear in the humid, or at least relatively humid, uh, boreal forests of North America and Eurasia. So Gloger's rule has been documented in primates, uh, but other than that, its generality, it appears quite limited. Rappaport in 1982 noted that the latitudinal breadth of a species range tends to increase as we move from equatorial species up in latitude towards the poles. So, for example, consider the wide distribution of the caribou, Rangifer tarandus, right? Really widely distributed species, obviously at high latitudes uh, around the Arctic Circle. In comparison to the very restricted range of the Eld's deer pictured here, which lives in tropical Southeast Asia, much closer uh, to the equator. So it's argued uh, that species living at high altitudes like the caribou, um, they're adapted to this relatively broad range of seasonal environmental conditions, right? So, uh, you know, in June, we've got the sun never setting. And then, um, you know, obviously in December, uh, perennial darkness. So these huge swings uh, that caribou have to deal with. In contrast, tropical species are adapted to a more stable climate. Um, thus, they may have evolved towards more ecological specialization and have narrower distributions. I'll conclude this lecture with the latitudinal gradient in species diversity. So this was probably the first global ecological pattern that was described by naturalists. So species diversity, i.e. the number of species per unit area, is going to decrease as we move away from the equator up towards the poles. So, for example, there are less than 40 species of mammals that inhabit latitudes above the Arctic Circle. But as we move towards the equator, mammalian species richness increases. 
And as we get all the way here to Costa Rica, we're going to peak at about 160 species of mammals that inhabit uh, these lush tropical Costa Rican rainforests. So there's quite a few hypotheses uh, that have been put forth to explain this, uh, you know, pretty um, solid observation that exists not only in mammals but in a whole variety of different taxa. Um, these hypotheses aren't mutually exclusive, uh, and I just wanted to go over two really quickly. The first is the out of tropics model, and it posits that most mammalian clades evolved, originated in the tropics. In the tropics, they experience low extinction rates, so species tend to persist for longer periods of time. And from the tropics, they're going to move out and colonize subtropical and temperate regions as a function of distance. And then another argument is the metabolic hypothesis, and it's going to argue uh, that the higher primary productivity of tropical habitats just results in higher rates of speciation as well as lower extinction rates um, because they're more stable in comparison uh, to temperate habitats. When you think about these habitats uh, just during the Pleistocene, to scene with uh, you know glaciers uh, advancing and then retreating we see uh, a lot of variability over time and with that I will bring lecture 4.3 to a close I am super excited about our next lecture so I'll be discussing mammalian mating systems and parental investment so please tune in next time cheers <laughs>